Jeff Cowan here from Jeff Cowan's Pro Talk, and I'm back with a new edition of my podcast entitled Right Service, Write Your Own Paycheck, the path to earning over $100,000 a year when writing service in the automotive industry in the United States of America, Canada, and Australia. And you know, at this very recording, just over 20% of you are doing just that, earning over $100,000 a year in this great career. But that means that nearly 80% of you doing the job are not. So what are we going to do about that? Well, like I always like to say, I believe this with all my heart, I think that you should continue to watch my podcast. Go back and watch all the old ones that I've done. Listen to them. Go to my website, AutomotiveServiceTraining.com and watch the videos there. Read the articles, the blogs, and with all of that, you will find the content, the processes, the techniques, and the word tracks that you need to maximize the opportunity you have every single day you're out there with the public in service. I'm coming to you today with what I, what I feel is, again, a very timely message. And I'm going to be speaking mostly to car dealerships, and some of you, and I want you to hang in here, uh, because you're going to see that what I'm going to prove to you is that the service industry, the service end of the automotive industry, if you're in that, you have a very secure future ahead of you. What do I mean? Well, right now, there seems to be this mad rush. Everybody at the car dealership seems to be, to be going down this path of, you know, we got to put all of our stuff online. we gotta get, we got to eliminate all the human interaction. People don't like talking to people. They don't like going to dealerships and blah, 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 blah. And so what's happening is, is that people are, are trying to make a decision how far they should go down that path. And I've seen uh, what I think is a lot of fear in this area. And you know what? Should you be fearful of it? No. Uh, should you be concerned? Yes. And here's why I think people are. You know, when, when you see headlines that say things that like Carvana, okay, Carvana sold over 177,500 used cars in 2019, making themselves the third largest retailer of used cars, that gets your attention. When you read things like Tesla predicts in the year 2020 that they're going to sell over 500,000 new units, that gets your attention. And when companies like Amazon and Wayfair and the like uh, say, say and do anything, that gets your attention. Why? Because those companies do their business almost totally online with very, very little human interaction. So again, we're asking ourselves, you know, should we be doing the same thing at the car dealership? And, I, and you know, I, I hope I proved to you today that I don't think you should go totally down that road. You know, you've got these big, beautiful dealerships, and I don't see, understand why we're doing everything we can to keep people from coming to the dealership. I mean, to me, that just never makes sense. When you have a retail store, you want people to come to it. You know, so I'm just not going to sit here and argue and give opinions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to encourage you to take a look at history. Because as you start to think about how much online should we go, how far down that road, should we go? I think if you look at history, you'll find your answer. Okay, so what do I mean? Well, let's take a look at Sears. You know, because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a history buff. I want to point, point out this. You know, you've heard me say this many, many times. I love presidential history. I love American history. I love military history, but I also love retail history. Now, let's talk about Sears when we start looking at history, because there's this is where your answer is going to be. You know, in the late 1800s, uh, 1880, somewhere around that time, Sears started their business. And it was a catalog business. All the way up to 1925, all they did was sell through a catalog. Now, in that process, they became the number one seller of retail dry goods in the United States of America. I mean, they were a monster. But as 1925 approached, Mr. Sears started seeing that he was getting beat in the cities by department stores. Collectively, when they put all their numbers together, they were beating him. He couldn't figure out why that was happening, so he did some research. And when he went to these department stores, what he learned was this. Is that when somebody ordered something from a catalog, for example, like a pair of shoes, typically all they got was the pair of shoes. But when they went into these department stores for the same pair of shoes, they not only got the shoes, but they bought more product to, and, and on an average doubled or tripled the amount of the original sell. Why did that happen? He believed, as I believed, it was because people like touching, feeling, and experiencing the product. They love talking to knowledgeable clerks and salespeople. So in 1925, Sears opened their first brick and mortar store. And they just didn't open their first brick and mortar store that was just a bunch of, a tall building with a bunch of different floors that were designated to products. What he did was, is he totally redesigned what a department store was, how it was to be laid out. He introduced clerks and, and salespeople and commission that it was totally unique to the time and over the next 65 years 
dominated the retail world in the United States of America. Now, most people falsely believe that the reason Sears went out of business was because of the internet, and they were they were on the ropes way before the internet came around. You know, I mean, they they just were. Their trouble started in the late '70s and early '80s, and it was and what the trouble was is they stopped doing what kept them so vibrant for 65 years, and that they kept they they stopped uh, reinventing what the department store was, and they allowed places like Best Buy, Home Depot, and eventually Walmart come in and knock them off the the, the number one rung there. That's where that started. Now the internet was the one that finally put them out, but it was that was way over before that. But for 65 years, they dominated with brick and mortar. Well, if you take a look at Amazon, you're seeing right now history repeating itself. I mean, Amazon's a behemoth, right? I mean, they do almost everything entirely online, but if you're paying attention, you're seeing that they're doing exactly what Sears did so many years ago. If you take a look at what they've done here recently, uh, they are opening, uh, they bought, what was it, Whole Foods, the grocery store. They're starting their own Amazon grocery stores. They've got their own Amazon convenience stores, brick and mortar that you can go into. They've got their own Amazon bookstores. And as we sit here recording this right now, they're now developing the Amazon department store. Many people feel that the future of the malls is going to be strong, it's going to come back, but they're going to be dominated with a big anchor called Amazon department store, and then a lot of their associate stores spread out throughout the mall. Now why is Amazon doing that? Well they're discovering the same thing that, that Sears did. You know, Amazon started out being an online bookstore and when people get online to buy a book, typically heavily discounted by the way, typically all they buy is that one book. But what they've discovered is if they walk into a brick and mortar store where they can physically touch the product and, and whatnot and talk to knowledgeable clerks and salespeople, that one book sale will turn into three or four and that ticket goes from an average of $20 up to $90, $100, $100 plus. Okay, so they in, in the, are in the process of going brick and mortar. All right, another company called Wayfair started out about a decade ago being an online furniture store and have done re very, very well, but they've discovered the same thing, that when somebody gets online to buy a certain piece of furniture, that's all they buy. If they have brick and mortar, the sale will double, triple, and go through the roof. And so they are now going around the country opening a brick and mortar stores. Now, why are these companies doing that beyond what I've already said? Because check this number, I think this is extremely telling. Because even today, with all the internet business that goes on, all the online tra transactions, 86, 86% 86 of any sale that's made on, the, on a daily basis in the United States per, of, of America, 86% of all sales still are being done face-to-face, voice-to-voice, human interaction. 86%. And the bigger the ticket, you know, the dollar amount, the more people want to talk to somebody or see them uh, face face to face. All right, so again, the trend is is the, the a lot of auto dealers out there are trying to copy some of their 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 competitors out there, Carvana, Tesla, and the like, because these people are moving a lot of product and they're making a lot of money almost totally online. So they're wondering, should they be doing the same same thing? Same thing. And I think the reason they do that is because the media, the, the media spin that surrounds Carvana and, and Tesla, they make it sound like that this is really, really a big deal. But before you throw in the towel, I would encourage you to take a look at what you have because I think these companies are easy to compete with. And I think you could almost, if you wanted to, put them out of business. I, would, I mean, I would certainly exploit their weaknesses. So let's take a look at these two companies, Carvana and Tesla. Carvana, yes, when you, when you hear that they sold 177,500 plus used vehicles in 2019, that sounds like a lot because that's a big number. But when you factor in that over 40 million, 40 million used cars were sold in that same time frame, it seems to sound, not sound so big, doesn't it? Now, I think they're be beatable and here's why. Uh, you have service. They don't. You have a service department, they don't. And at some point in time, that's going to catch up, uh, up to them. Okay, I mean, it, it certainly is. Now, how would you beat them? Now, you know, if they're in my backyard and they're really hurting my used car business, I'm going to take them head on. And so what I would do is I would exploit the fact that if you get it here, we can service it here. I would even throw something into the deal or add it into the deal where they got a one or two year free maintenance program. Now, if you've watched my past recordings, you're going to see that I hate free maintenance programs. Hate them. I hate it.
it when the manufacturers do that with the new cars, and most of the manufacturers have tried it, most of them have gone away from it for reasons we don't have the time to talk about here. But in this instance, if, if Carvana was in my backyard, I'd exploit that they don't have service, and I'd exploit that we will give you a service uh, agreement for free for the first one or two years. And that keeps them coming back to your dealership, which keeps them gets them comfortable with it, which gets them to buy more cars, cars that need to be serviced, which support us right here. Now, another thing they have is a seven-day test drive, and you can bring it back. Have you seen what that involves? I mean, it's so restrictive, it's not even funny. You can match that. You could do that easily, right? And when it comes to if they want to buy one with no human interaction, you can do that, and here's the kicker. You don't even have to buy a big, fancy vending machine. You want to know why? You have a dealership. You can do no-touch no uh, delivery with them. You can get where it buys online. So, again, you've got the one thing they have. You don't don't have. That is a dealership and a service department and a way to service the department. So, I service service these, these people's vehicles and that's going to be and it is big for these, these customers and I would exploit that to no end okay because they've got some competitors coming on doing the same thing and I would stop that in, in my backyard if I had to. Let's move on to Tesla. Now Tesla over the last several years have made very very many believers out of a lot of naysayers just in the last couple of years with what they've done you know but again offer what they can't offer what they can't now again because again it's proven out that people like going to dealerships they like touching and feeling the product and they like the, the interaction with knowledgeable clerks and salespeople. i mean yes they sold they, they may sell 500 units 500,000 500,000 a half million units in the year 2020 but there's going to be over 17 million total sold new units in in the united states and again that's a nice ch chunk but but Okay, 16.5 million people still went to a car dealership, and it, and, and, and it, even, it even sounds less uh, like a big deal uh, for, for Tesla to sell half a million when you factor this in. When you factor in the used cars, the 40 million plus the 16.5 million, you've now got over 56 million people that went to a car dealership, a used car lot of some kind, to a building and talked to people and touched the car and test drove the car before they bought it okay before they bought it all right so again it may sound like a lot but I think they're beatable because you've got the one thing they don't do they've got the dealership you've got the knowledgeable people and if you can continue to build this experience and make this experience maybe a little different than it is today uh, you can put your, your, your throat on their neck okay I mean I wouldn't let them dictate what the future of the car business is going to be you holding all the cards here I mean you are don't be intimidated by them now let's go on here they've also uh, got some other problems here. And their other problems is their service. Now, what are we talking about their service? Well, they don't have very many shops you can go to. That's a big problem for them. It's very expensive to service a, a, a Tesla, so I would, I, I would hammer that. They have a parts problem in some of these areas, and getting the parts that needs when these cars break or they're crashed or whatever. And I think in the long run, and in the very short term, I think they're going to have a technician problem. Because right now, they already have a technician problem. We have a technician problem. We can't find these people, right? They can't either. And they've got less to pull from because it's such a unique type of vehicle. On top of that their big thing is if you don't want to come to our service center because we don't have very many we'll come to your home well that's great right now but if they start selling doing the kind of volume they're talking about that's going to be a big problem technicians are going to go to the car to, to, to the traditional way of, of, of servicing cars which is a climate controlled building that has lifts that has tools that has parts that, that has all the things that, that, that that's going to make their life easy so they can turn the a maximum amount of hours I mean show me the technician that are going to want to go out in the freezing cold and work on a car. Show me the technicians who want to stand out in the blazing heat in the middle of the desert in some of these communities and work on a car. In the rain, the sleet, the snow, the wind. It's, it's, a, it's a problem for them now, but it's even going to be bigger, and I would explo ex exploit that. Why? Because you've got the dealership, you've got the service departments. Now, let's take a look at the next thing when it comes to Tesla. All right. With their power plant and the way it works, I mean, they've, they've drawn in a lot of people. You know what I mean? It woke a lot of people up of their inventiveness and, and, and what they can do with, it, with this new technology. But let's just be real clear about this. Do you really think that Ford, GM, Chrysler, Nissan, Honda, Toyota, Kia, Hyundai, BMW, Mercedes, Audi, Subaru, and the like are not going to answer that bell? Yes, they're going to answer that bell. And when they answer that bell, they're going to answer it big, and they're going to answer it with a dealer network where over 55 million people 
people went to some building and talked to some person and touched and felt the car before they bought it. And if you want to take the used cars out of it, still over 16.5 million people went to new car dealerships and purchased these cars because of the knowledge of the clerks and the salespeople and being able to touch and drive the, the, the vehicle. You know, they're going to answer this, this and they're going to, to answer this bell and they're going to answer it with the dealer network. So if they think the dealer network and the manufacturers work together, you can start to set the tone and you can start to force Tesla's hands. Now, it sounds like I might have a beef with Car Car Carvana and Tesla. I don't. I think what they're doing is inventive. I think what they're doing is timely. Well, I think what they're doing has opened a lot of eyes. But there's going to be a point where this is going to, where their model is going to have a problem. These are these are companies that are public publicly traded companies. They have stockholders, and stockholders are, are only going to be so impressed with the number of units you move before they're going to want to see more money. What's the best way to make more money when you're selling cars? Accessories, finance. I mean, uh, in insurance, gap insurance, all these different things. And the stockholders are going to demand that companies like Carvana and Tesla jump in that. And when they jump in it, it's going to require people. It's going to require human interaction. And those people are going to have to play, have a place to sit, a dealership, okay? So sooner or later, they're going to have to have some place other than just a big vending machine and just mail order to get these cars. On top of that, as the stockholders continue to buy their stock, they're going to want to see more and more profits above that. Okay, and they're going to start to question, how come we're not in the most lucrative part of the automotive industry and in car sales, which is parts and service? And they're going to demand that Tesla and Carvana have parts and service departments. Okay, and that requires people to work in those, and that requires buildings. Again, dealerships. Okay, so you're holding all the cards here. And again, when you can factor in that 86% of all sales are still done face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice, -voice, the cards are in your hand. So although these people are going to continue to be players and, and major players, I, I, would, I would stop the fear. And what I would do is I'd flip it on them. And I would not let these people uh, define what the future of the automotive industry is going to be and what sales and service is going to look like. You define it. You force their hand. That's what I would do. I'd go on the offense and I'd put them on the defense. And right now is the time to do it because they're reaching numbers where what I just got through talking about is going to be important, all these things. So giving convenience you know, uh, to, the, to the customer and making the buying experience and the service experience uh, be, be comfortable for them has always been important. It's always been the number one goal when you're talking to customers. You want to be convenient, you want to be comfortable for them, right? And we're lucky today because technology is, is helping us to be more efficient in producing that type of result. But history is a great teacher here. I really think it is. It's taught us that catalogs, internet shopping, and technology can bring a lot to the table in the way of sales with minimum human, human interaction. But here's what history has also taught us. Write this down. Write this down. History has taught us that people like dealing with people. 86% of all sales made on a daily basis in the United States of America still require face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice -voice interaction here. So history has taught us that people like dealing with people, especially when making large purchases, which is what we do, right? So the human interaction delivers the best results to the bottom line and that's not likely to change. Hey, my name is Jeff Cowan. I have a company called Jeff Cowan's Pro. Talk, dial that number right there, 1-800-248-2931, 1-800-248-2931, or go to automotiveservicetraining.com, automotiveservicetraining.com, or call me personally, 317-506-1003, 317-506-1003. Anybody that picks up those phones, we can tell you how we will get you substantially increased sales, higher hours for your pay order. We will get you higher survey scores, if not perfect survey scores, highest customer retention, highest effective labor agent. Here's the thing that people love about us most is we will get rid of your disgruntled customers, your heat cases right now. We are the best at what we do. Jeff Cowan's Pro Talk, man, we are badasses when we get it done and we get it done fast and we will get it done for you. Whether you're an individual service advisor wanting to be the best you can be or you're a business owner or service manager, we make it happen. That's my message this week. I'll be back next week or the week after that with another one. You don't have to worry about that. I want you to come back. I want you to continue to listen. Give me a call. Give me a text. Love hearing from you between now and the next time we meet. God bless you all. I will see you soon. Take care.